Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we're particularly delighted to uh, welcome Shruti Gonzalez today to the CPR CSH Urban Workshop Series. It's our 75th talk, so it's uh, special to us. Uh, she's going to talk about uh, the title that we had circulated was Lending to Women with Informal Incomes and Property Titles. And she's going to focus on uh, the experiences of uh, Seva uh, Grehrin Limited uh, with a focus on urbanization and issues relating to land titles. Uh, Shruti has over 18 years of experience in project finance, capacity building, monitoring and evaluation, and operations management. And she's worked extensively with both government and non-government agencies in rural development through institution building and promotion of livelihoods as a human resource, as well as in the areas of fund mobilization and financial product design. Shruti is presently uh, the Chief Executive Officer at Seva Grehrin Limited, which is Seva's for-profit initiative with a pan-India focus to provide housing finance to poor women working in the informal sector. Uh, Shruti, we're really happy to have you here today talking to us about a subject that has uh, wide ramifications for the urban sector. Um, as you already know, we'll have 45 minutes of Shruti speaking with us with uh, maybe two to three rounds. And if we have more enthusiasm, a couple more of questions after that. Thanks, Shruti. Thank you, Mukta. That was a nice introduction. A um, couple of things. I mean, I have absolutely, and which I was telling everybody, the rest of the colleagues over here, I am not an academician. Neither I have any research background. And what I'm going to talk about today is absolutely out of experience and uh, the kind of uh, work that we do at SEVA, especially in the uh, housing finance space. So, uh, there is a minor change over here. Uh, what we wanted to say is that those who build houses can hardly uh, afford, afford to build their own houses. So with that, uh, I will start with my uh, kind of uh, presentation. Uh, some of the statistics are very well known to all of you. The kind of uh, estimates that there is need of 2 million new houses every year in India and out of which uh, 40 million homes that need to be improved to provide safe sanitary permanent housing. Uh, most of these houses what we talk about in urban space. Uh, see, uh, when we talk about uh, the kind of uh, housing finance that is required, a structured housing finance which needs to go to this client base or market segment, the biggest hurdle we face is the informality of tenor. So if we go by the World Bank uh, definition of housing finance, there are four quadrants to it. The formal, formal, formal income, formal tenure, the formal income and informal tenure, which is what we deal with some portion of it. The completely informal, the informal income, informal tenor is also what we deal with. And if it is a formal title, then there is very less chances that they would have an informal income. There would be ways and means where you can track their income levels. But the segment which we are focusing on is the informal tenure, informal title. So, uh, most of these issues crop up because the urbanization, the pace of urbanization as we know is pretty fast than any kind of uh, decisions at policy level that are likely to happen. The urbanization is a very dynamic situation. People shift from rural areas to urban cities in search for livelihoods, in search for uh, better opportunities. and when they decide that they have a certain uh, regularity of income, which the income at uh, rural areas are not able to provide, then they decide to stay in that city or that town. Now, the situation what comes up is that they cannot really afford to stay in a high rental uh, say, locality because their income levels do not permit it. So, they shift to the basically the Juggi Jopri clusters or the slums what we know them for. And they have been staying there for 10 years, 20 years, whatever. They are essentially our service providers. But in spite of staying there for 20, 25, 30 years, 
and having a, a formal or a kind of authentic uh, utility connections, electricity bills, light bills, uh, I mean, uh, water connection, etc. The titles, unfortunately, have not seen any kind of change. They've, the piece of land on which they are staying, whether uh, it was a possession slip or a license to stay or a patta, there has been no change at all. And government after government, they keep on talking about regularizing and creating such kind of structure where uh, these people by paying nominal penalty fees are able to regularize their uh, land titles. But those are not coming forth so very easily. And we all know that there are uh, political ramifications to it. There is always a very sensitive issue because these people are the vote banks of various uh, uh, political parties. And hence, when we look at uh, it in totality, though this is a very productive workforce, but half of their time is uh, spent in uh, getting their uh, no, uh, the, uh, basic utilities in place, having access to any kind of financial systems and having access to any kind of formal channels of financial systems. Let me put it that way. So that is where the challenges start cropping up. So, uh, so basically what we have tried to highlight is that these are the three, uh, I mean four categories of uh, housing finance which it, uh, uh, housing finance companies which they cater to, uh, the high income group, the middle income group and the EWS. We definitely focus on the EWS and LIG segment. Uh, Mr. Arun Jetli also in his speech had uh, spoken out about the 20 million housing demand and that is the reason why they have this housing for all by 2020. Demand for LIG and uh, EWS is nearly 90% as far as formality of tenure is concerned. Uh, what are the different lending models? The private project done by developers, the government led projects, the PPB model government ties up with a developer and owner driven construction or the retail housing finance which we do. Now uh, there are quite a few developments which we, uh, which we can see in the space policy space right now on the private project done by developers. The government led project has definitely seen a sea change into what it used to be 10 years ago and what it is now. Uh, PPP model is gradually being developed with the current uh, government in place. So uh, housing being a state subject, so there is not as any central policy as such on how to deal with land titles or uh, uh, property titles and there is not a single agency or a single kind of a authority which you can reach out to. So for example, I was talking to Arkaja that uh, we have our branch in Indore. And if I want to see, look at the property title, do I go to Indoor Municipal Corporation or do I go to Indoor Development Authority? Now, if I go to Municipal Corporation, they have this uh, whole map of the city, uh, which is a master plan and which we can uh, easily locate whether the locality or the colony where I want to land, whether it actually exists on their maps or not. But as far as land use is concerned, then I have to go to the development authority. Now, even in Delhi, we all know the situation between DDA and DUSIP, the Delhi Urban Slum Improvement Board and the Delhi Development Authority. When the urbanization uh, started off in Delhi and the government, the then government uh, thought about providing any kind of uh, stop gap titles to those people that was started way back in 1970-72 during Indira Gandhi's time and that is how the JJ clusters of uh, Raghubir Nagar, Jahangir Puri, Mangol Puri all those cropped up. Now in 1972 those people have got pattas, I mean sorry not pattas but possession slip 
and possession slip means that you have a right to stay on that land but you don't own that land you don't have any rights to possess so since you do not have a right to possess even if you are staying there for more than 30 years you can't mortgage it see if, as a housing finance company if i want to create a mortgage on those titles property titles the legal system in the country is such that i am not allowed to create a mortgage so how do i uh, create a system or a, i mean in financial terms we all have metrics for anything we do we always have a metrics so <laughs> my colleagues at hupa are laughing about it so uh, we have credit rating metrics we have income rating metrics and we also have a legal metrics so which i come to by and by but i just wanted to flag off this issue that any titles which has to be evaluated you have to look at it from the adverse possession view you have to look at it from whether i can create a mortgage on it whether there is any lien from anybody's uh, any other authority on that so all those issues have to be uh, kind of uh, looked upon before i can actually pass on a small amount of 3 lakh or 4 lakh loan to those families now uh, the other other issue which i wanted to uh, highlight was that the average ratio of housing value to annual housing income is 8 is to 10 in india which means that a family's affordability of having a house of their own is very very low compared to what exists in other developed countries and which i am sure you all are also aware of so so that is the reason when we talk about uh, whether my loan can be affordable to the family of 5 to 6 people who uh, all of them would be earning and would be in totality they would be making a, uh, around 30 35000 per month whether that will be affordable for them because the land prices are very high if they want to even move out from the informal title colonies of say uh, jahangir puri or other areas and buy any kind of ews housing which are coming up these days then ews housing itself is around 12 to 13 to 15 lakh a uh, uh, normal uh, one or two bhk we have financed some of them but then the income levels will have to be completely checked and if i go by completely informal income of a profile of client a lady who is a vegetable vendor and her spouse who is an auto rickshaw driver and maybe her son is doing another informal sector work then it doesn't match up they simply cannot afford it so what we do is that uh, we kind of look at what is the semi documented income that i can find whether they are working in any retail outlet whether the owner can give us a kind of a salary certificate of that particular individual and try and build up a case whereby we can say that they have a regular income and they will be able to afford the uh, pro- uh, property which we are going to help them finance uh what what is the change <laughs> uh see the possession slip was allotted for example in 1972 we all know that there is a secondary market which exists as far as selling is concerned and selling of property has been happening through the general power of attorney through more than 2 3 decades so what has what would it have ideally happened is that they would have sold it to through a gpa to a family there is no registration of that sale which has happened so in the government records it would still exist on my name the original allottee's name for example if i was the original allottee it will be still in the name of shruti gonzalez even if i have sold it to mukta and mukta has sold it to arkaja and arkaja has probably sold it to you still it would be in my name so we take that entire chain of that gpa 
the chain of unregistered documents. And that chain is very, very important for us to go back to Dusib or the uh, slum board or the slum cell in DDA and figure out whether that uh, property was originally allotted to Shruti Gonzalez or not. Now, uh, uh, what exactly is land tenure? It refers to the way in which a land is held by an individual from the government. So, whether that ownership right exists or not. How a person residing on it looks at it. He owns the land, stayed there since decades, purchased with this land doc chain documents, have possession slip in the name of the parents or in-laws. So, for them, that is the only property that they own and that is the only piece of land which is a tangible asset for the family. So, for all purpose and reasons, they think that this is the property which I own, whether the government has given me a possession slip or government has registered my property or not is not very important for them. How formal lending institutions look at land tenure? Registered means you have to have a sale deed, title deed, whose information can be traced from the government records. Since Indian law requires complete registration of sale of land. Now, how we look at it? So, part of it, I have already explained in my earlier uh, presentation of slides. Uh, women having long association with SEVA and having a good track record of dealing with various SEVA projects. Uh, I am sure all of you are aware about what SEVA is. Uh, Self-Employed Women's Association. Uh, Women residing in an area having a possession slip and the plot is not cancelled. So, for example, if I uh, cite the incidents of Shavda Ghevra, which is a resettled colony. So, government had given 10,000 uh, 10, licenses in 2006. Then thereafter, the people from various parts of Delhi who were uprooted from Lakshmi Nagar or whichever areas, were asked to move almost around 30-35 kilometers beyond the periphery of the city. So there was loss of livelihood and many of these people did not actually shift to Shavda Ghevra because they were just given an empty plot of land. They were not given any money to build or construct houses over there. So And these licenses were only given for a period of 10 years. So uh, Typically what happened, many of them decided not to go there, shift there because there was, it was having an immediate impact on their uh, income levels and thus uh, towards 2007-8 when the government did their own monitoring and realized that many of these possession slips were or rather the license uh, which were allotted have not been occupied, they actually cancelled it. Because there was also incidents of a duplicate uh, licenses being allotted by local money lenders and the JAT group which exists over there. So, uh, we also look at these possession slips and whether those plots are cancelled or not cancelled. Uh, can you just explain the license a little more? Like what was the license for? The license was to stay on that piece of property for 10 years. So, owned by the company. Yes. Resettlement. But, uh, uh, excuse me, the plot, there was nothing apart from the plot, that's what you're saying? Pardon? There was nothing apart from the plot, no houses, nothing? No, no. It was just a piece of land. And water supply, drainage? No, nothing. No basic infrastructure, no access through proper roads, no water supply, no sewage lines, nothing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No transfer, just. Okay, you can put your tent mostly. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, as much as I know about Shavda Ghevra, and perhaps Arkaja and the other team members can also share their experience, they were shifted there in peak of monsoon. And uh, so 
perhaps i mean if anybody has any experience they can share it but as much as i know and the stories that i hear from my members seva members is that is what it was and they really had horrendous time for nearly around 2 to 3 months so uh, in that scenario uh, we see that whether they have this uh, uh, any kind of uh, current address which we can uh, prove through the uh, utility bills like electricity bills and water bills in case of shavda ghevra what typically happened was that they actually mortgage those piece of licenses to the local money lender and they took around 3 to 4 lakh to build whatever makeshift dwelling that they could manage so so many of our loans have actually gone into uh, uh, kind of swapping of those debt the earlier debts of those money lenders and getting the license back now 2016 incidentally june those licenses the validity gets over and uh, we have been approaching the delhi government uh, the authorities at dusip uh, but so far there has been no clarity about whether those licenses are going to be renewed for another period of 10 years or they would be made freehold as was promised by the current state government at delhi that most of this uh, areas would be made freehold on payment of a small penal penalty fees so but that is the situation now i'm just explaining a bit about seva grahren but before i get into it the uh, reason i wa- the a couple of things which i wanted to highlight was that there is this it's not that these people cannot actually afford to pay the emi which we uh, lend at say we, we lend at 18% honestly i mean i'm telling this because our model that we have worked out is very heavy on street and we have to do lots of cross referencing and uh, double checking of the income level etc so they it's that they can really afford they and they do not want to default on the uh, payment of the emis because as i was explaining this is the only piece of land that they will ever have in their lifetime how do you fit them all those challenges of informality of income informality of tenure and make make it acceptable as a formal housing finance product which would then be acceptable by our regulator which is national housing bank so our processes and everything has to be top notch it has to be at par with all the uh, i don't know what has happened okay so uh, uh, at, at par with formal housing finance companies not that we are informal housing finance companies but if i say uh, the housing finance companies like hdfc or dhfl or top uh, top of those hfc Uh, bandwidth so uh, what we are looking at is the kind of experience that uh, seva has within its network of lending to informal income and informal titles we some of you may have worked or may have visited seva bank and would have also have heard about mahila housing seva trust uh, seva bank is the arm within seva which provides the banking facilities to these informal uh, uh, workers but unfortunately it is only uh, limited within gujarat it cannot function outside gujarat because uh, the uh, rbi does not permit it to function outside gujarat since it's an urban cooperative bank it's not a multi state cooperative bank so whatever experiences that they have are of uh, gujarat and by far gujarat maharashtra and some of the states have better revenue records than would exist in states like delhi or rajasthan or uh, mp or even bihar and uttarakhand mahila housing trust is a uh, trust not for profit trust which focuses on providing basic infrastructure facilities into the slums and into all these areas wherever seva has its member base so mahila housing trust 
within seva has been experimenting a lot with this informal title properties so whether it is delhi or rajasthan where you have patta and by the way those pattas not necessarily are only of 90 years the pattas which were given by the uh, governments in rajasthan and mp in 95 98 also had with uh, this very restrictive clauses that you cannot transfer those pattas to any other institution which in hindi is called ki isko aap hastantaran nahi kar sakte hai so those kind of clauses were there in those pattas so how do you work around the system and make it more acceptable is what i am going to explain to you and what is what which is what is essentially is the experience of seva grerin so uh, this slide basically explains how seva grerin is a natural extension of seva network uh, just briefly to tell you that seva over last 18 20 years has grown uh, quite steadily outside gujarat so we have very strong base in madhya pradesh rajasthan uttarakhand bihar uh, where seva bank could not function we have started uh, registering and uh, uh, kind of setting up uh, thrift and co credit cooperative societies so these are also member based institutions but at least it provides an avenues of small amount of savings and also avenues for small amount of credit for their income generation activities so uh, as uh, seva grew outside gujarat and as member became more and more no i don't think it's maybe maybe because we lost the network connection So, uh, so basically, within Seva member base itself, there was a demand for housing finance, and uh, that is the reason why uh, Seva Grerin was established. Uh, I'll also get, uh, I mean, inform you about how we managed to establish a for-profit company into essentially a social movement. <laughs> Maybe it might be of interest to some of you. so uh, seva caters to owner driven construction model with informal land tenures inhabitants of informal settlement especially women and children are at range of risk giving women the ownership right secures their future because uh, the idea is to help women develop an asset in their own name and thereby securitize their future and also provide lots of uh, uh, i mean uh, kind of uh, Uh, enhance their health issue i mean not health issues but health improve their health and also provide a safe and secured housing large number of its borrowers have informal income and usually have incremental demand for housing so in this second half we have uh, shown what are which kind of housing finance companies are functioning at which strata of market segment uh, Seva Grerin, MHFC, and microfinance are into the typical that informal sector. Swarna Pragati uh, is definitely uh, in the informal sector in informal tenure, but their focus is essentially on the rural space, which perhaps Arkaja you will be able to tell them about. Uh, Mahindra Housing is also there, but they their focus is also on rural space. Then we have Shubham Shriram. we have government into the lig government is also there in the ews segment but uh, very small percentage then there are formal banks and the formal lending institutions for big, big ticket size prashuti huh. in that uh, classification all these not a very large amount but maybe not too small either so all the ews Which is built by formal builders. As you know, let's say all of Gurgaon, whenever a builder builds something, he has to build 15 percent units. Where do you put that? Obviously, there's not. A lot of them may not be bought by people 
who actually are AWS as a whole issue there. But in the way you are thinking, are you also thinking about financing somebody who wants to buy that kind of house as one of your clients? Is that a space that you consider or not? Yes. See, there are two ways of look, uh, doing housing finance. One is, one is you do the retail housing finance, which we do right now. And one is to tie up with the developer and then see that many of your or some of your member base get uh, houses over there or are interested in picking up a house over there. That is also one way of doing it. As of now, we are not doing it because as a startup HFC, one also has to look at the capital uh, which, have, which may be kind of blocked over there in any kind of developer-led model. It typically takes at least, uh, they say it will be over and they will be giving possession in 24 months, but it usually takes nearly 36 months. And while we try, we disburse the uh, uh, total overall loan requirement in tranches. So there would be a pl approved plan and you would be saying that, okay, when the plan is approved, when the plinth level is constructed, we will give you this much amount, apart from the 10% of down payment. And when the walls are up and the windows are being done up, we will give you the balance 25% and the balance when you are ready to give possession. But that remaining 35% is where the problem starts cropping up. Because for me, I have given that much amount to my member or the borrower and he or she starts paying the EMI on that amount. While he or she is also spending on the rentals or wherever they are staying. And the actual possession comes to them only after 24, 28 or 36 months down the line. I think this is where the uh, real estate bill is like pro proposes to address this problem by making developers compensate uh, home buyers for delays in possession. For the delay part, but it still doesn't address the issue that the model is based on. Sorry. It would address the delay part, the real estate bill, but I think it still doesn't address this problem that the whole model is based on, you know, you put up your money, like the promoter gets the money from the buyers before they've actually started, you know, digging the ground. And so there is this time period where the, there's going to be a rent and there's going to be an EMI. You know, it's so that's, really yeah, think. yeah. So that's just the business model of this kind of, this format of real estate. Because for me, the mortgage will get created once the people get possession. So until and unless we, I don't show to my regulator that I have a mortgageable title, it will still be an unsecured loan in my books. So from the housing finance perspective, which is purely a finance discussion, but that is how it will be viewed. So at any point of time uh, during this process, if the project gets stalled or something, then uh, essentially as a finance company, then you are in trouble there, right? Because yes. you are... More than in, uh, we being in trouble, uh, it's also the uh, clients whom we are trying to help. See, the idea is to help the SEVA members, not only SEVA members, but similar profile. Currently also we have, and in subsequent slides you will see, we have given by this uh, 31st March, we have given 301 loans. Not all of them are SEVA members, but similar profile. So they would be uh, out of an affordability index of say 30-35%, they would be shelling out 15% on the rentals and additional 25% on paying my EMI. So that makes it a little difficult. Uh, we as of now are, uh, we, I mean, according to us and uh, whatever we have heard from the peer groups, we are perhaps the only one which are dealing with the informality of land titles in the housing finance space, the formal housing finance space. Uh, induction into financial services fold. We view that, uh, see, when I talk about the credit lending, housing finance is at the end of the spectrum. I mean, one starts building the credit history by, first of all, applying for, say, credit card 
or having an auto loan or a two wheeler loan then taking small loans for businesses and then ultimately be eligible for housing finance so over here we are saying that although government in the urban space has provided all these schemes of jan dhan yojana and they are giving them uh, bank accounts and everything else but in terms of formal housing or formal credit perhaps in lives of many of this 300 women whom we have reached out to this would be a first instance of getting a formal finance from a formal institution so we are helping build a credit history for seva just to be clear most of the people you are lending to they don't have any credit history and they also do they need do you need them to be part of an sag or some other collective no. which has credit history that also is okay. incidentally when we run those bureau checks hmm. i'm sure you are all aware about uh, the civil high mark and there are four bureaus which as a hfc we are supposed to register to and high mark is where most of the nbfc microfinance also uh, put in their data and submit their data so when we do a high mark check some of these uh, women low i mean the credit history is available in terms of microfinance loans more in our case the women is the main applicant but whoever is the earning member of the family and whoever is staying under the same roof and sharing the same kitchen by the way sharing of same kitchen is very important <laughs> so if they are sharing the same kitchen then they are our co applicants so we have co applicants as high as around 7 to 8 at times when we do a bureau check on all those co applicants then we see lots of those auto loans two wheeler loans especially for the male members and which our women members are not aware of But uh, credit cooperatives don't report to the bureaus, Sanjana. They don't. They don't report. Unfortunately, credit uh, cooperative societies. I mean, that is the uh, biggest lacuna in the financial system. When we talk about financial inclusion, the NBFC MFIs are supposed to have these all these regulatory compliances. The credit cooperative societies, because they follow the cooperative societies act of respective state. They are not. Uh, they don't come under the RBI radar. And the fourth impact, which we, uh, according to us, is the basic need for housing or uh, kind of a safe uh, dwelling and a shelter for them. Uh, see this basically explains the kind of uh, model that we apply in mitigating the risk relating to operating in this segment uh, high cost of customer acquisition and collection is uh, kind of mitigated for us because we are already dealing with a captive seva client base we already have that in various geographies where we operate even if we do not reach out to them there is uh, enough uh, information and we can also reach out to our client base who can then do uh, word of mouth kind of uh, uh, no awareness creation for seva grains product so sourcing and collection of customers directly by loan officers and through seva network is what we do we do not use those uh, service agent models a difficulty in assessing credit worthiness of borrowers so we do lots of uh, bureau checks are definitely done uh, through reference checks so when i talk about referral checks uh, that is where what sanjana was talking about comes into play we do check up with our credit cooperative society whether that women has uh, borrowed from credit cooperative society or not and what has been her track record uh, apart from that when we have to assess their income levels we actually go to their area of uh, employment 
So if she is a domestic worker, we actually approach her employer, figure out what is the uh, salary that she has been drawing, how many years. If she is a vegetable vendor, I can explain to you, we recently did a case of a vegetable vendor who works in Karol Bagh. And so my branch manager actually went there, met the other grocery shop owners, the other local shop owners, what is the, uh, how has been her behavior, what kind of uh, uh, income she would be earning on per day basis, etc. So similar kind of uh, checks and references we are also doing for other co-applicants as well. To then arrive at a complete assessment of what is a family uh, per month income. And where are all those expenses? Because when we run the bureau checks, then we can actually figure out what would be their payment of all those EMIs against auto loans, against two-wheeler loans. And by the way, let me tell you, most of these people have a two-wheeler. We feel that they cannot afford, but they can definitely afford a secondary uh, sold-out uh, sold bikes or a, a scooter or something. So they have a two-wheeler loan going on them, most of them, in urban spaces. Uh, so for, in our credit policy, we uh, immediately deduct the kind of subsistence allowance or subsistence, subsistence amount that a family would require for their day-to-day uh, -day, uh, meals and other food and grocery items throughout the month. So if a family of six is having an income of say around 30,000, we immediately deduct around 8,000 for their uh, requirement of food and other things. After that, we arrive at what is the uh, her uh, the family savings habit, what are the other utility bills that they have been paying, whether there's, there has been any kind of other uh, EMIs that they are supposed to pay, and then arrive at an affordability. and then uh, tell them about what could be an approximate loan size which we can give them and what could be an EMI. Disbursement is obviously done through tranches to ensure the end use of funds. Uh, loans of smaller ticket size to cater to the needs of EW, EWS based on their income visibility. Regular customer visits and checks. So uh, apart from that, we also have a third party legal vendor and a uh, technical vendor who provides uh, checks on the legal uh, documents, also on the technical document. When I say technical vendor, they have to go to the urban development authorities and see whether those property or plots are actually existing on their maps or not. Absence of clear title and of land and property, so paralegal title to establish ownership, alternate collateral documents, so we do take uh, utility bills, we also take uh, uh, into account the uh, number of years they have stayed in those, in that particular dwelling. If it is say more than 12 years on their own property, though it is an informal tenure and it, if it is not a government property, then automatically adverse possession doctrine sets in. If it's a government land, so for example, Jahangir Puri, which was allotted in 1972, and the original allotee is staying there now, then adverse possession is automatically ad applicable to them. And by adverse possession, they become possessor, possessor of that piece of land, whether the government actually regularizes it or not. So that is the uh, kind of view we have taken on legal legality of these documents. And uh, uh, as I was explaining earlier, we have all those metrics. So legal metrics clearly talks about various kind of scenarios about when the this kind of doctrine sets in. Even in the cases of uh, Pattas, like in Jaipur and uh, Indore, Ujjain and other areas of Rajasthan MP, there are different kind of pattas. So some of the pattas which were distributed later on in 2002-2006, those have those 99 years of lease, etc. And which makes it uh, appropriate for us to provide any kind of housing finance. What, uh, what do you mean by a paralegal title to establish ownership? 
So that's what I'm saying. So using the adverse possession and other things. So what is the document that you use? We are uh, the house uh, the house loan agreement itself HLA itself talks about that they are staying in this. Uh, sorry, just. The uh, agreement itself has these clauses that if they are in that and before that we would have done the legal vetting. So if they are there for more than 30 years, then we can uh, create an equitable mortgage on it or a, a, a document which proves that this property will be owned or has been owned by this individual. And our lawyers itself have drafted it in such a way that... Uh, clearly states that this family owning this possession slip, having been stayed over there for 30 years, is uh, now the owner, the, I mean, now they can be deemed to be the owner of this property. So the basis is the possession slip yeah. and the duration. Mm -hmm. Have you had instances where uh, people you've given loans to have been evicted from that land? Not so far. We don't do illegal colonies or irregular colonies. We go by the uh, JJ cluster list, which are regularized. By the way, let me tell you, even the Jangirpuri, there is a circular by Dusif which through which you can regularize this uh, uh, possession slip. But what there are three stages to it, in which you, uh, no, you are not aware of. No. Uh, so if this uh, original allotty has been staying there and is now wanting to regularize the color of, uh, the uh, property, he or she has to pay 63,000. If there is a sale before 2007, then they have to pay 3 lakh to make it regularized. And if it is after 2007, then they have to pay 11 lakh to regularize it. So, and do you uh, fund that process as well? So yes, it's a, we do. The regularization. By due sale. We, it's tenure, tenure, absolutely tenure, nothing to do with planning. In fact, DUSIB, all the policies of DUSIB, I mean many of them are absolutely silent on planning, on whether the... But they thing, have no jurisdiction over mm -hmm. it anyway, so, over planning. So, oh. Land owned by them. But this is not land owned by them. They'll get freehold. 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 The circular is very clear. It will be freehold on payment of this penalty. Uh, to answer your question whether we finance, we do, we have done such couple of cases. But many a times our clients are very uh, clear that we do not want to spend this additional amount. We have been staying there for more than 30 years, since last uh, two, three generations. Nobody has evicted us. Why should we pay this additional 3-4 lakhs? Even additional 63,000 people are not at all. See, uh, let me tell you, even for processing fees of 2%, they come to us that why don't you deduct it from our tranches? They do not have that kind of liquidity of paying 6 to 8,000 or 5,000 of uh, pro processing fees. We do not do it because we are not allowed to do it by our regulator. The processing fees has to be paid up front. No, no. Possession, there is no time limit or validity period on that. But they got this possession slip on in 72, 74. And since then, there has been no change on the government record of what actually happened to those possession slips. Whether the government has made it freehold or in, whether they want to treat it as a long-term lease or what is the scenario. It's a possession slip and that's what it is.
Shruti, maybe we can move ahead with the presentation and then sort of take questions at the end. Otherwise, you won't get to the end of it. Yeah. Ha, so I was uh, for that we do disbursement in tranches. We actually monitor the utilization of funds is going in for the housing fine or the dev creating or construction of housing or any kind of home repairs. We don't give uh, bulk tranche or one shot bullet payment except in the cases of loan against property. So for, for example, if we uh, are talking about the Shauda Gevra cases, which were given to, uh, the piece of land was given to them and they were given license, which they in turn had to mortgage to the local uh, money lenders. Now to get back those license, we had to pay them in bulk. So that we are treating as loan against property. There is no construction happening over there. But in many areas of Delhi and other, even all across India, there are several instances where people would have mortgaged their property and they would be now wanting it back. But uh, NHP, the, for NHP, this is loan against property. They do not treat it as housing finance until and unless new construction is happening in it. So, uh, Basically, the issues are small monthly disposable income, borrowers incapable of servicing large loans, credit assessment is definitely a, a time taking process. So if you say what is my turnaround time, it would be definitely in the range of around uh, three to four weeks by the time we complete the whole process. And provided we get all the clarity and all the information from our clients. Absence of clear title to land and uncertainty of laws relating to ownership and tenure. Because as I was telling you, there is not a single authority whom we can reach out to for any kind of clarity on property titles. Collection, yes, uh, because of microfinance and largely uh, also dealing with informal uh, money lenders, they do believe in cash collections. So providing EMI, through checks or through PDCs is also proving to be a challenge. But we are educating them on that. Absence of documentary evidence of income and credit worthiness. Difficulty in sourcing credit worthy customers at re reasonable cost. Because most of our clients would be saying that we are SEVA clients, we are SEVA, SEVA members. So that means that they are eligible and automatically eligible for housing finance. Then you have to explain to them that there are other things which we need to look into. Uh, control on end use of funds, because try as we might, a portion of it definitely goes for their own consumption. These are the basically a uh, sample of, uh, it's a very, I don't know whether it's legible or not, but one is this uh, provision of identity slip, which is the uh, slum JJ department. And this is the pink slip is what the people in uh, Shavda Givra got, the license to stay. This is the only piece of uh, property title or license that they have. Lots of challenges which I am not going to talk about at all because you have we would have realized it by now. Uh, okay. So this is our portfolio, and I just wanted to touch upon the fact that these are our uh, investors as of now. SMBT Seva Mutual Benefit Trust is our promoter, uh, which is the Seva Trust, Seva entity which has promoted the housing finance company. We have. Affordable Housing Capital Gateway, Acumen Funds, HDFC, Hoodco, Access Bank, NHB and Low Capital. So all these people came together to put that 13.5 CR initially, out of which 10 crore is the net on fund, 
which any housing finance company has to maintain to even get registration from National Housing Bank. So, housing finance for say, otherwise is also, and I'm sure you all are very well aware, it's a very capital intensive business. You have to be perpetually raising debt and capital. <laughs> Most of this shareholding pattern also keeps on changing. Which is why, uh, who I, perhaps I was telling Mukta, we, these days we are very, I mean, completely neck dip into all this compliance and rights issue and all those things. So, uh, I mean, the challenges are plenty. Liaising with government agencies for approval, documentation itself is a huge challenge. And who do we approach is the biggest question which we grapple with every time. Even by the time we develop any repo with anybody in DUSIB, she or he gets changed. And by the time we hear that, okay, we heard from last May that they are coming up with policies for regularizing, for making this freehold. It's been more than a year and there's nothing that has happened. Same goes for any other states. So even in I mean, for example, Indore and some of the cities which are declared as uh, supposedly smart cities. So, smart cities has changed the oh, entire contour of which are the areas where we can land, which are the areas where one fine day government may just evict those colonies and res resettle them elsewhere. Now, by the time they figure out which are which slums they will prioritize and they will shift where, it will be almost a nearly a year, year and a half. So, policy or any kind of clarity from the government agencies is very, very slow. But the demand is definitely there and people's affordability is also there if you assess their income properly. Uh, lack of sync between schemes such as housing for all and smart city, there is no correlation. Housing for all and because of that you have that PMAY, Pradhan Mantri Awas Yojana. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, no. no, no, I can go on and on about PMAY. Anyways, so it doesn't take into account that uh, what is the impact it will have on this uh, smart cities or what smart cities will have an impact on PMAY. Now, how do I land on this in that area? Indore is one such uh, branch where we are immediately being impacted by it. Uh, high registration cost versus affordability of slums, uh, affordability of uh, household in the slums basically informal lending at high costs, uh, high operational expenditure and low margin for HFC, but this is purely financial. <laughs> Poor leverage on credit link subsidy, challenges in identification of uh, public lending institution by central level nodal agency. This is absolutely on PMAY. Uh, and to transfer credit link subsidy to the end beneficiary at subsidized interest rate of 6.5%. They have identified, but we are not able to uptake those uh, credit subsidies, essentially because mine is an improvement loan, incremental loan. These are not new construction. Like what is an imp like what is an improvement in that sense? So if 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 I have a one story house and I add like a second floor to it, is that does that count as improvement or does yes. that count as new construction? Improvement. improvement. It's called incremental upgrade. Okay. So. Uh, so typically I am okay. Sure. No, but like ahead. so new construction is essentially something that's built on like empty land. Empty. Zero or, construction is what is plain piece of land where you do that plain come up with those walls, then slabs, that's it. People are willing to do it. Many so people... Find a piece of land in a no, they, they demolish. They demolish. Many have done it. In uh, Jahangir Puri, we have several cases. Because... So then that is allowed. That is zero construction. 
also we uh, it's not that we haven't applied for uh, this uh, CLSS we have done but out of those 301 cases we probably could manage only 30 such cases while ideally the scheme is meant for our client base you know, the kind of people whom we cater to informal income, informal tenor that's what PMAY is meant for Uh, sir, we are dealing with uh, property titles and housing is a state subject. So, any state uh, department which deals with urban development uh, machinery, whether it is municipal corporation or development authority or urban development authority or for example even gel board, we need to uh, approach them for the clarity on the land titles. Or if at all there has been any notification from their side on uh, how do we treat certain land titles. Can we hold the hand to the presentation? Can you finish the presentation? I am nearly done, Mukta. It's a challenge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, sure, sure. Please. So, as far as the land titles are concerned, why don't we use the e-governance, apna khata, like all the states are having the uh, land records online uh, electronically. So, uh, why can't they be used for... Uh, uh, Not all states. Uh, but uh, but uh, it is quite, uh, I think, 10 years back it started and all these states are supposed to do it. Like in Rajasthan, there is the Apna Khata, uh, so they are different names in different states and these records are there electronically, digitally. Yeah, they started as part of the Jadanivarim reform, the, the scheme that was launched in 2005, digitization of land records. Yes. It still appears in smart cities and Amrut reforms because the reform is not completed as yet. So, uh, various states are at different levels of regularizing or putting up that digitized record. But it is not available uh, as widely. Mostly, most of the slum areas where they are lending, such records are not available. Also, uh, just to add. I'd like to add to that, which is that the type of land record related documentation that they are looking for, even in a fully digitized Apna Khata system, those documents will not be there. Mm -hmm. You know, the various, you know, because the, this is a level below the land record and you know so this is if each agency whichever type of letter they are issuing if they are digitizing that you still have to look in the agencies it's not going it's never going to come together on one platform because it's not uh, what are conventionally thought of as land ownership documents so but it is meant to clarify on the land or uh, title uh, title uh, clarity on titles land title or ownership Except okay, this is not we, title, right? They don't own. They don't actually own the land. They only have possession slips, so they only have licenses to live on that. They don't own the land; is not theirs. What is typically happening? So therefore, they will not have title documents to it, and therefore, it will not show up in the land record system. No. So if Seva knows that they don't have land titles, and they are living there, what are they That's exactly what she illustrated in the earlier part of the presentation. What they use, they use alternative documentation. So just what I'm to trying to say is, if you know that someone is doing something illegal. You are trying to say, okay, we'll find out whether uh, we can legalize what this person is. Uh, Hang on, just, what, just a moment. What show, so you, should, you came in after in most of the presentation. So this was discussed and presented earlier. In this particular part so far, my understanding, Shruti, is that you are not lending to settlements which are not recognized and which are illegal at this point in Definitely. Right? We don't so, deal with irregular colonies. So they are not looking at structures of this area and there was a whole discussion on a whole presentation on what exactly are the kind of documentation they are using in order to uh, substitute for a formal land title. Maybe mm -hmm. af after the questions are over, if we have time, we can what go back to that. You would be surprised as to what people have and don't have. So uh, I suggest we let this thing go on and then we can come back to this. You seem to have missed the earlier part yeah. of the presentation which would have addressed this. They don't have a right to... They just live in... 
you, you missed the earlier part of the presentation, so that's... Can we have some other questions, please? I would request you to hold this discussion till the end and you can then clarify with her separately. Uh, can I please request you to have this discussion with the speaker separately because we've already been through this for the rest of the presentation. Anybody else has questions? Hillary, why don't you come up? One of the things about cooperatives is that cooperatives often form cooperatives of cooperatives. And um, in, in the case of, of small lending institutions, one of the most important things for sustainability is, and for, for, for upscaling the, the nature of these institutions, is um, insurance. And you, you gave a lot, of dem, a lot of illustrations of how risk is dealt with with respect to clients, but not with respect to the institution itself. Is there a mortgage insurance uh, system that you participate in, and is it specific to cooperatives? Okay, so uh, insurance, let me answer it in two separate ways. Insurance of our clients, we definitely do. But it, it is essentially of uh, nature of life insurance. And the only purpose that a housing finance company ultimately has is to safeguard its overall uh, loan amount at the end of it. Just to reserve. It's, just just to, reserve. it's called credit shield mm -hmm. in the insurance parlance. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, none of the insurance agencies can come up with any kind of insurance for the property. Okay. Because as, uh, I mean, now, I don't know whether he wants to talk, call them squatters and he wants to call them as people who are encroaching on a piece of land where they have no rights to stay. But government itself has given them for those possession slip. Possession slip gives them right to stay. License does give them right to stay. It's not that they have snatched it from the government and gone there and plumped themselves. So that proves that they do have a right to stay. It's only the question about ownership of that property. Now, how do you prove that they have this ownership and whereby as a housing finance company, I can create mortgage is what I explained earlier. Coming back to the mortgage guarantee, and where we, it can help us to scale up our operation. There is a credit guarantee fund available from the government. That's uh, the credit guarantee says that against each loan that I give, I need to pay the government at least 1 and 1.5 to 2 percent of that overall loan amount. And therefore, at the end of the tenure, if that person defaults, or turns an NPA, non-performing asset for me, then that amount of loan is guaranteed by the government. But for me to shell out that 1.5 to 2 percent upfront is a difficult proposition until and uh, unless we achieve a certain volume. Mm 